afternoon or oh, good day, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's um, program, which is a book launch. Of Felucci, we went into mute. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I did not unmute myself. My apologies. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us for today's um, event. Um, welcome to the book launch um, of the book titled Exploring African Approaches to International Law, Essays in Honor of Keban Bayou. Um, this book launch is a joint um, event that is co-hosted by the Center for Human Rights um, Faculty of Law, University of Pretoria, and the Kabarak School of Law in Kenya. And on behalf of the two institutions, I would like to officially welcome you to this um, event. My name is Folusho Adigalu. I'm a co-manager in the Litigation and Implementation Unit at the Center for Human Rights. And I also um, happen to be one of the editors of the book, so I really look forward to this engagement. And um, I will be the master of ceremony for this event. And, um, I will take us through the event and the sequence of events as we go along. And now I would like to um, call the director of the Center for Human Rights, Professor Franz Fijun, to give us his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Felucio. Good afternoon here from our part of the world. Good day to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, in particular, my two co-editors, Felucio and uh, Humphrey Sipala, and the many co-authors who are with us this afternoon, and also obviously then everyone else who join to learn more about the project and maybe to see how we can join hands going forward. Um, it is with a sense of relief, I, I'd say, that we now can announce the publication of this book because of those of us who've been involved in the process would know that the book publication is really the third of a three-stage process. The first which now seems so far ago in the past, was in May 2017, when we had a round table at the Center for Human Rights here in the University of Pretoria to really start to explore, to look at the idea of African approaches. And I think we, um, we were, in a sense, um, not knowing exactly where all this would head, but that was the kind of uh, germinating moment for, for this. And a number of people... Uh, on this call and involved in the book were, were there and I single out it's also you know in the book itself we list the names uh, Professor Ambani who is now the Dean at the Law School of University of Kabarak um, um, you know Humphrey Sipala himself people like uh, Babatunde Fagbaibo uh, one of the co-authors Serge Professor Serge Kamba uh, and others uh, who were there we we I think think back with uh, tenderness and fondness but also uh, realizing that time has lapsed. Now, the initial roundtable um, was then followed more than a year later, December 2018, by a conference, bringing together many more scholars. Many of you, many of you were there, most of the authors. Um, there, we also made the link much more explicit to the work, the life and times, the influence of Keba and Bai. And in a sense, then the third phase, the book brings together the African approaches and the Keba and Bai um, a filter through which we look at the issues at hand. I thank everyone who's been involved in this long process, and I really thank people for their patience. Uh, but where we are today, I think, is exciting uh, because it's not as much just a launch of a book, but also taking stock of how we can now see this evolving into next phases. And we look forward to the discussion. Uh, we thank very much um, Emeritus uh, Chief Justice uh, Mutunga, who is with us, and we'll also talk to the issue of uh, kind of where from now and henceforth. Let me for a moment just put my hat, if I may, as a person involved with the editorial committee of the Pretoria University Law Press. Let me just say that from the point of view of the Pretoria University Law Press pulp, this uh, is a very, very welcome, remarkable publication. Pretoria University Law Press wants to publish uh, innovative scholarship, wants to publish and give voice to African scholars and wants to ensure that neglected topics, thematic areas, are being also taken up. And I think this book, this publication, fulfills all those uh, criteria. Uh, we as uh, Pulp are very, very uh, happy that this book came through our um, kind of processes. And I just remind everyone that this is obviously an open 
access publication pubs publications are all open access and in the future we commit ourselves to advancing further scholarship around the issue of African approaches to international law and law generally speaking and um, we commit ourselves thus once again welcome to everyone to this uh, discussion we really um, appreciate your interest and uh, we look forward to hearing your views and hopefully inspire you to read the book if you've not done that before and see how we can all get involved in taking this project forward. Thank you so much, Felucia. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Ian, um, for the historical um, overview of the book and the road to publication. I would like to invite um, the Dean of um, the Cabaret School of Law, um, Professor John Ambani, to also give us some insight into the institutional partnership and support between the center and the Cabaret Law School with regards to this book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicio, for the opportunity. Um, as you will know, any interactions between uh, myself and the center is always a, a great moment. Um, in, a, in a traditional African setting, an animal would have lost its life already <laughs> for many reasons. One, because I schooled there. Um, the other one, because Pretoria continues to be a major partner um, in the generation of knowledge um, in this part of the world. It's also always exciting to see my doctoral thesis supervisor, Professor Franz Villion, who I believe continues to be a major asset uh, for the African people, uh, not just in his work as director of the Center for Human Rights, but as a great teacher uh, on the African soil and beyond, but also as a human rights practitioner um, who has been working um, human rights tribunals, um, litigating human rights issues. So being here is quite, quite exciting, and it's something that I will put down in my records in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it's, it is also quite exciting to be here because it celebrates our relationship, um, uh, the relationship between Kabarak and Pretoria. Already on my staff, um, other than myself, uh, four or so other colleagues who went through the Center for Human Rights, uh, which means that Kabarak could as well be an outpost of the center or a satellite, a satellite campus for the Center for Human Rights. And that is something to encourage. We have many other lined up, um, hopefully coming there, and that should in fact entrench the tradition. I'm also very happy that uh, Pretoria has led the way in university publishing in this part of the world. Um, if you notice, we have also recently uh, launched our press, uh, Kabarak University Press, um, which has already published the inaugural lecture by the former Chief Justice, uh, Professor William Tunga, who is with us here has published um, what I've called uh, Guido Mwigai's magna opus. Uh, Guido Mwigai is the former Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya. And I think we are emulating quite well uh, what Pretoria has done. And obviously partnerships of this kind involving, for example, my own colleague and editor-in-chief of Kabarak University Press, Mr. Humphrey Spala and Professor Franz and Folucio are the kind of partnership that will further university publishing in the area of Africa. Those who know, know that that kind of institution collapsed long ago. And I think it would be measures such as this uh, that Pretoria started earlier on in the, in the century and which Kabarak has now emulated that will revive or bring an, a, you know, a, a renewal of academic publishing on the African soil. So that is something to celebrate. And then if I may, though I'm not qualified, just make a few comments on uh, the occasion today, uh, the book launch. One of the comments I am happy to make is that this book celebrates a great African, Kebambai. Um, it's a tradition, again, we must continue uh, to celebrate our own, because if we don't, others won't, or when they do, they won't give the right tribute. We must continue this tradition. Um, the other thing that the book does for me so well is to de-neocolonize. To de um, international law. Uh, we've heard about Twail and, and, and all that, but I think this is another forum where we are looking again at what neocolonialism has been teaching and, uh, you know, and uh, telling our stories as the Africans. 
But most importantly, which will be my last point, is that it is not about whining. Uh, looking at the book, um, I'm privileged to have attended the initial conferences, as Professor said, and I'm aware that it's not just about complaints, not empty, um, you know, whining that the Africans tend to do sometimes. It is offering alternative positions, alternative approaches to international law, and I think that is really what is critical. A time must come when Africans must provide frameworks. Um, that we can use, you know, to study our own issues, to study our own matters, to study phenomena. It is common in African scholarship that the philosophical framework would be Western, but then African sources could be used maybe to prove a point or a fact, as evidence of an issue or the other. It's rarely the case uh, that African scholarship relies on Africans' own frameworks to explain the phenomena under discussion. So for this, I think I praise uh, Professor Franz and Felicio and Humphrey for putting together academics of African origin, mostly, uh, to write serious um, ideas about what we can do differently going forward in this area of international law. With that said, I congratulate you all, and I welcome this relationship for this and other um, activities in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ambani, and um, I'm sure uh, we also look forward to continue the additional engagement and um, also beyond. I mean, you are definitely a product of Pretoria, but just to also say that beyond Pretoria, we um, also get these things going. So I would um, like to then call on one of the editors of the book, um, Omfrey Sipala, to introduce us to the book uh, by giving us an overview of exploring African approaches to international law. Um, Onfrey Sipala is also a lecturer at the Cabra Law School. And um, Onfrey, please, you can have the floor. Thank you so much, Folusho. Uh, great seeing you, uh, uh, my co-editors, Folusho, Prof. Leon. And um, to see uh, some of uh, our co uh, authors who have been speaking quite a lot on email, but uh, haven't had uh, audiovisual conversation for quite some time. Um, great to be here. Um, as Prof. Leon said, this is a, an exciting moment. I, I must be frank, I, I had not allowed myself to be excited about the project for till yesterday evening when I realized, oh my goodness, this has actually come together after quite a journey. Uh, a very happy relief. Um, and, and we are all thankful for all who are here. Um, as I give the overview of the book, I, I thought to mention, um, as Prof said, we, we had a round table in May 2017, and we had the main conference on African approaches to international, international human rights, law, law and international law uh, in uh, 2018. In 2019, at the African um, the Af 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 African Association for International Economic Law um, Conference at Strathmore University. I met uh, Kehinde Olaoye and um, had a quick fascinating conversation from her paper presentation. I thought, we have this project and you really should join. Uh, we're trying to put together some works on African approaches to international law. Um, I think your paper was interesting. And she said, no, 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 I'll do you one better. I'll write you an original piece on Kevin Bayer's dissenting opinions uh, in international investment law arbitrations in the 1980s. And so happy to, to see uh, Kehinde is also here. So one happy addition post uh, conference. Um, so th the book has started off really reflecting on, on African approaches to international law in those two conferences and using Kebambai as a symbol, as, as this African scholar, practitioner of law, jurist who put in a lot of his effort, a lot of his, who invested his person, not just his, his, um, his intellect, but quite really his person into advancing African approaches to, to law. Um, he's a figure who, in fact, is the only Senegalese who agreed to join the Senegalese civil service at independence. Most of the ones who were working for the colony decided to remain in France. And he continued from 1960, a path that blazed a trail towards crafting new ideas, beginning with family law and going into constitutional law as the 
the president and, and, and uh, the president of the Supreme Court of Senegal, 1964 to 1981, um, before he moves to the ICJ, and then his 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 contributions to international law explode. He had already begun this uh, when he was a member of the Commission for Human Rights from 1972 to 1978. Um, so, I mean, a figure who in many ways touched almost with a minus touch every area of international law that he dealt with, every area of law that he dealt with. Um, and so it, it, he seemed quite like a natural figure to allow us to enter into this conversation around what approaches after the, the analysis that we have been so happy, glad, uh, privileged to have learned under Twain, uh, can we look back and think about now our specificities? Um, so the, the, the book then beautifully flourished our, in a sense, with Kebambai's inspiration, but into other areas that were not necessarily Kebambai's um, uh, own inspiration, but uh, by extension, are uh, com uh, conversations about approaches to international law. Um, and so the book is divided into five broad areas. A first, the first broad area covers uh, Kevin Bay's own contributions to, 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 to these approaches um, with a historical and biographic piece by myself and, and uh, um, Mariam Kamunyu writes an interesting piece on how the African Charter is gen on Af the gender responsiveness of the African Charter and begins by taking note of Kevin Bayer's initial draft of the African Charter, which had provisions on women's rights that quite tragically disappeared. And um, it's, 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 it's an excellent reminder that uh, had we kept his draft, we had would have begun the Maputo Protocol in 1981. Um, so, so and, and then there's, uh, there's a piece by Kehinde on, on his work with the dissenting opinions and international investment law arbitrations. Uh, the second section goes into, into the, the inspirations, I would say, of uh, Kibambayas in international law. Um, there's one on international legal theory by Rashmi Rahman. Um, this is an excellent piece interacting with the idea that uh, Global South states are interacting with international law, not as in a passive uh, laid back position, but on, 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 on the avant-garde and, and challenging uh, how international law is used. In, 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 uh, in, she uses the term the grammar uh, and takes us to the, the, the interactions, the challenges. And this one really good way of looking at how the global South is interacting with, the globe, with international law by how it challenges the status quo questions. Um, an excellent example here being in, in the in the Chagos uh, case. Um, th then Maxwell Miyawa takes us through a critique of, uh, uh, now this comes to where the one area where Kebamba is quite well known for, and those are exploratory perspectives of international human rights law. Uh, Maxwell Miyawa takes us through um, an analysis of the communitarian ethic of cultural critique. And again, uses the human rights corpus as used in Africa to, to as a challenge to, to the Western understanding. Um, Mumbi and Sandra uh, take us to through a conversation about statelessness, which was curiously one of the, the, the areas of uh, human rights law that the African Charter didn't explicitly pronounce on and um, uh, how African states are both legislating and practicing at double speak. Um, happy to have uh, Tom Zwart and uh, Serge Kamga here, um, their piece is on Gachacha and Judea transitional justice systems. It, it cannot be said enough, the, the importance of these examples as, as clarifications that alternative systems do work and can continue to work with, with a certain grounding in its, its communities. But, um, um, then we go to the next section of the book, which is on exploratory perspectives to environment and criminal law international environment and criminal law. Barcelo Guchuku uh, takes us to a conversation. COP27 is going on right now. So a lot of international law world is thinking around environmental protection. Uh, Basil first begins by reminding us that, that um, Africa's 
was had a treaty on conservation of the environment in 1968, a good four years before Stockholm 1972. And again, couldn't be a better way to start a conversation on how Africa has been participating in constructing an international law that makes sense for itself. James Nyao um, uh, takes us through a conversation about African states' interaction with the negotiations for the Rome Statute. Um, and then we come to, to the last section. And the, the, this is about the pedagogy of international law. We have two pieces by Robertunde Fekbaibo and uh, Emma Lubale uh, on how the human, how we can rethink decolonizing education um, and rethinking how we teach international law in a way that is intelligible to students. And this pro probably takes me to, to what I thought, thought is my, my take home from this piece. As a teacher of public international law to law schools, to, to you know, undergrad students, um, I'm always at pains to, to find a text that gives us precisely the conversations that we want to have. Uh, John Dugard has his international law from an African, South African perspective, an excellent text from 2011, I think. Um, uh, uh, I also have one fairly dated text uh, was put together by FX Njenga, published in 2001. FX Njenga was a Kenyan international law practitioner who himself um, contributed quite a bit. But and, I, and we have a lot of critical pieces, particularly from the Twail tradition on how international law doesn't quite fit what we can say are our experiences about international law as a continent, as a global South people. I'm excited about the work that we've been, we've been able to produce in this book because hopefully we can add to this corpus of text that, we, that can be used to teach what Africa is doing in international law, not just say what international law doesn't acknowledge about what we do, but actually speaks about what these contributions are. And I think that's what Professor Mbani was speaking about. That it's, it's speaking about the contributions. Um, and, it, and, and I'm hoping that uh, this is the first of many texts like this that we will, that we will, that will take a stab at attacking probably the, the most important institution in, in pedagogy, which is the textbook. We must liberate the textbook with positive instructional material about what the Global South has been doing. Uh, while we continue with our journal level critiques about what uh, is going wrong, we, we, we must contribute to the provision of the texts that teach. So that one, if when one is teaching international criminal law, the, uh, Kamga and Zwart are, are an excellent piece to add to that. You know, it's not just critique, it's also this is what is being done. And, and I think that, that would be my, my, my quick initial contributions to, to what I see is the book and what, what I think could be the take home from it. Um, thank you, Fulusha. Um, thank you very much, Humphrey, and um, thank you for the insightful um, overview. Just to quickly say before we move to the next segment of this um, event that we have the Pretoria University Law Press um, questionnaire. It's on the chat box um, just posted by Lizette. Please um, take your time to just fill the form just for purposes of um, the Pretoria University Law Press. Um, thank you. And I think, yes, Andre, you did uh, you know, mention a couple of interesting things, but I think I would... Um, I would take it off from one of the names that you mentioned, um, the interesting incident that you had with um, Dr. Olawi. And I see you spoke a little bit about some of the things that um, she wrote about. So um, I will start with her, but just to give a brief um, explanation of what this segment is all about. We will be calling on um, the authors that are present. I think I see about four or five at the moment. And um, so you will have about two to three minutes, please um, make it very brief to just present, um, you know, just an insight into what the chapter was um, and how it contributed to African approaches to international law. I think essentially that is how um, we would want it to go. 
So our first um, author that we will um, be calling um, is Dr. Kende Olaoye, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the City University of Hong Kong. And um, she wrote um, the chapter on the Eden majority, investor state arbitration, and the legacy of Keban Bayou. Um, Dr. Olaoye, you may take the floor, please. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Well, it's evening here, so if, good evening from Hong Kong. So my name is Kende Olaoye, and it was a pleasure to have written chapter three of the book. And I would like to thank the editors who have done a very excellent job of ensuring that the book was actually commit, um, completed. So my name is Kende Olaoye. I'm originally, I'm Nigerian and I write and teach and publish on international arbitration, trade law, and a number of other issues. So I would like to highlight three main themes in my chapter. So the first thing is the chapter focuses or foc yeah, the chapter focuses on Keba Mbaye's contribution to international investment law, which is a very controversial field of international investment law. It's also a field that has lots of implications for African states. And you know, there are reasons for this. One of the main reasons is the fact that lots of African states find themselves as respondents. For example, we find South Africa, which has chosen to, um, well, has chosen not to write, has chosen and has decided that it would not sign international investment treaties anymore. So in my chapter one, I highlight Kepa Mbaye's contributions by focusing on his dissenting opinions, but also his general you know, writing and his work. And I divide this into three stages. So the period before his first appointment to an ICSID arbitration tribunal, ICSID is an arbitration institution under the World Bank, which is the leading institution for setting disputes between foreign investors and host states. So by focusing on his dissenting opinions and also focusing on his writings and also focusing on his you know, contributions and the things that inspired his writings and his thoughts, his thought process, I was able to highlight some very, very important things which you would probably not find in jurisprudence. For example, if you pick a European arbitrator and these main things or the main issues which stand out, for example, are emphasis on permanent sovereignty over natural resources, and also an emphasis on broader issues like human rights and calculation of damages. Now, this is important because until recently, the general impression was that African states were sort of rule takers, not rule makers in international investment law. So I hope with my contribution that I'm able to show how Keba Mbaye was well ahead of his time. Many of the issues he discussed, many of the issues he emphasized are now very, very important issues. And I hope that it will be an important piece for future engagement with international investment on the continent. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Olaye, and um, thank you for keeping it um, brief and precise. And I will move to our next um, speaker now. Maybe just um, to say, um, if for those of us that are around, that I can see at the moment, um, this is the um, order in which I would call, just to put, uh, not put us on the spot. So I would call next um, the duo of Professor Sedis Kamba and Kanga and um, Tom Swart. And then after that, I would call Professor um, Rashmi Rahman. And I see um, Mumbi is also um, online, so I would call Mumbi. I saw Professor Fagbari at the other time, but I can't see him at the moment. So those are the um, three people that I have on my list, and um, I will call the authors in that in that sequence. So now um, I would want to welcome um, the duo of um, professors um, Kamga and Professor Swat to um, speak to us briefly about um, their their chapter, which is on attacker and judicial um, transitional justice, uncovering the merits of African indigenous justice systems with the help of the receptor approach to human rights. So unfortunately, perhaps we have three to four minutes, so you can decide how um, you want to use the time between the two of you. Thank you. We will do it very efficiently. Thank you so much. Uh, 
congratulations to the editors and our fellow authors on this uh, great book. I've actually had the great honor of spending a few days in the company of Judge Mabaya once. This was in April 1981 during a conference held in The Hague on the right to development, hosted by the International Commission of Jurists. And at the time, Judge Mabai served as the chair of the commission, and I was a member of the organizing staff. So during our conversations, he impressed upon me the importance of the cultural, social, and political context in which law and human rights come to fruition. And these conversations today still serve as a source of inspiration. Now, I will now turn to uh, our chapter. The adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 was a revolutionary event for two reasons. First, the drafters recognized that all human rights epistemologies are equal and should therefore be reflected in the document. Second, they agreed that the Universal Declaration should be a people's charter. It should be applied as part of people-to-people -people, uh, relations. And therefore, the Universal Declaration should enjoy cultural legitimacy, as Abdouli Anaim has rightly put it. As Judge Mabai has stated, human rights are universal, but that does not mean that they have to be uniform. During the 1950s, it became apparent that actors in the global north were not so happy with the equality accorded to all human rights epistemologies. And they also objected to the context specific nature of human rights promoted by the Universal Declaration. Instead, they pushed the liberal human rights epistemology based on individualism, personal autonomy, and secularism as the only valid and therefore superior one. In this way, human rights became part of a mission civilatrice meant to bring the global south into line with liberal modernism. The receptor approach is a human rights theory developed by the cross-cultural network, a group of scholars, mainly from the global south, to counter this northern hegemony. And this approach draws inspiration from southern scholars, such as, of course, Keba Babai, but also Santos de Souza, Mignolo, and Lodovo Gercheni, and relies on indigenous knowledge. Underlying this approach is the idea that southern societies have a rich and long-standing human rights culture which came to fruition centuries or even millennia prior to the emergence of European enlightenment. Therefore, according to the, the receptor approach, human rights as a label may have been coined in the North, but as a concept, they have been part and parcel of Southern societies for millennia already. And as a consequence, human rights protection is not the prerogative of liberal Northerners, and is not restricted to formal legal institutions, but is also supported by social institutions, such as family relations, religion, and culture. And therefore, supporters of the receptor approach bring successful human rights approaches, which have been developed in Africa and other parts of the global south to the attention of international bodies and northern audiences. It's about telling our own stories, as Dean Abami said a moment ago. The receptor approach makes culturally based human rights protection mechanisms visible to ethnographic research and matches them to international human rights standards. If these culturally based practices fall short of these international obligations, the receptor approach will suggest homegrown remedies to which they can be amplified. In this way, human rights are embedded locally, which increases their legitimacy and ensures that they will be applied in people to people relations just at the framers of the Universal Declaration and Vision. Thank you so much. I think that Professor <clears throat> Kanka can now continue. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, college, uh, colleagues. I would like to start by thanking uh, Humphrey for the capturing our chapter the way he did. Uh, thank you very much. You made uh, my life, uh, my job easy, especially given that we don't have enough time. Uh, I would simply like to say, to point out that, uh, in fact, the application of the African approach can, it can be easily captured by looking at the gachacha in Rwanda and Jaya in Sudan to see how uh, these people use African approaches uh, informed by uh, African approaches to 
uh, implement or put social justice at play. It was important to see how this uh, this this play out, looking at the local reality, taking into account the ethnography of a people in advancing human rights. So uh, I don't want to spend more time on that. So, uh, safe to say that uh, perhaps a word on the receptor approach. Uh, my quota was very modest because he's actually the father of the receptor, the receptor approach. He wrote a piece in 2012 uh, that, that the title is Using Local Culture to Further the Implementation of Human Rights Law. And I just want to point this out because uh, for me, it, it, was, it was a pleasure to write this with him because it shows that when we are advancing African approach, it's not simply people, it's not simply developed by people from Africa. It's good to have global scholars, other scholars from other places to play a role in this. And uh, Tom Swart has been a champion of the global South and Africa through his work, throughout his life, he's been doing that. And it was a pleasure to see that together, we explore this and he was as familiar uh, to, to the gachacha as I was or as I am. So it was a piece where for us, it, it actually helped us to respond to a question posed by a book, by another book published by Palp, What is Africanness? Meaning, in our work, when we are advocating for this, we should not try to corner Africa in a specific place. To keep Africa is not like this approach is exclusively for African. We should be able to welcome on board everyone who shares our ideas, and that will help advance our discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, Swart and Prof. Um, Tanga for just insightful um, presentation. Uh, just before I call on our next um, speaker, I would like to acknowledge um, the presence of Professor Clara Bubano from the University of Ghent. Um, Professor Bubano is the leading scholar on provisional measures across all international human rights courts. Um, Prof, thank you for, for joining us for this event. And then um, I would move then to our next um, speaker, um, who, um, Professor Rashmi Rahman. Professor Rahman, you may take the floor, please. Hi, Fonusho, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's really great to meet all of you virtually after we met in South Africa all those years ago. And that was a pre-pandemic, a different time. And our lives have been fundamentally transformed in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend in the years between when we last met and this meeting. I'm incredibly grateful to the editors uh, for their extremely kind treatment of my work and to Humphrey especially for uh, today capturing uh, the summary of the chapter, which has really uh, spared me the effort of having to do it. So thanks very much, Humphrey, for everything, and especially for that. And thanks to Professor Will Hohen and Polusho uh, for their hard work in editing the chapter. Um, I am uh, simultaneously an insider and an outsider to this project in the sense that I'm not African, nor am I of African origin, I'm Indian, uh, but I sit in the global south in uh, the armpit of the Global South. And I join you as very much an insider in the Global South project, of which I believe Africa and Asia are equal and important stakeholders as our Latin American countries. And to an extent, my work in critical legal studies and in this chapter is an effort to advance uh, this commonality of vision between the post-colonial states that the sameness of our experience is more important uh, than the difference between the geographies. And I've tried to bring this out a little bit in my chapter. Uh, I think that this work and the contribution of the Pretoria University Law Press at this point in time is extraordinarily important uh, for two reasons. One, because we are today at 
a moment that resembles in many ways the 1970s, when there was this tremendous energy among the global South states to come together and to reinvent and reinvigorate the existing forums of international law, like the General Assembly, with their agenda, um, like the new international economic order. I feel like today with the creation of organizations like BIMSTEC and the reinvigoration of organizations like SARC and the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, ALCO, we are at a similar point in history where norm contestation in the creation of international law is not as important as global South-South alliances in international relations. And so to me, this work sig signifies a confluence of international law and international relations in a very meaningful way. And that is why I believe that um, the African Approaches Project um, is really well situated to be launched at this time. The second reason I feel strongly about um, this contribution that the Pretoria University Law Press is making is um, we now have, as Humphrey said, more material to teach our classes on public international law. And I'm grateful to all my authors and colleagues here uh, for their contributions here. It looks like we're starting something that resembles uh, what the National University of Singapore has been doing through their project called Teaching and Research in International Law, the Trilla project. And maybe this project could at some point take on something like that. And uh, so for these two reasons, I'm really happy uh, to be able to be a part of this project. And my chapter, like I said, is part of an ongoing effort to um, validate and give face to South-South collaborative works uh, in critical legal studies. Thanks very much, Fulusho. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Raman. Just to quickly highlight that um, Professor Raman is a professor of law at um, Jindal Law School and also the assistant director at the Center for International Legal Studies at Jindal Global University in India. Um, I will then call, I think, um, the next author that I can see now, Professor of um, Babatibe Fagba Igbo to um, quickly speak to us. Professor Fagba Igbo is a professor of um, human rights law at the University of South Africa. And he will be talking to us on his chapter, um, Rethinking International Law Education in Africa Towards an Ethologic Approach. Professor Fagba Igbo, you may take the floor, please. Oh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah, can okay. hear you. Oh, okay, okay, because I'm using um, any of this. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to, to present um, and to contribute to the book. Um, I, I know how uh, Folusha was uh, on my case to, to deliver on time, but um, it's a, it was a, a very enjoyable, um, uh, very enjoyable moment and uh, opportunity. I, my chapter, I know I have about three minutes and I will stick to the three minutes, but my, my chapter was um, mostly about, um, uh, on, on, uh, about teaching of, of, of international law in African universities and um, the, the focus. I mean, it's something, it's based on what I've actually been doing um, prior to, to, to writing this chapter on kind of um, um, thinking outside of the box and making it um, a very a, a, a 3D kind of um, approach, uh, a 3D approach to to teaching, yeah, uh, turning the classroom into a, a, a lively and um, uh, very informative, and um, also a, a classroom that is highly participatory for for students uh, on 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 the African continent. And um, <clears throat> I had looked at three kinds of um, Three and three ways of of teaching, uh, in uh, in of rethinking the teaching of uh, or the critical teaching of international or in African universities, um, and um, the part of one was um, looking at how they, we need more collaborations across the continent um, between and among um, international law scholars from east to west um, to north, and I I think that is. We we've been uh, the Center for Human Rights as well has been able to 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 contribute to that immensely as well. I think um, we um, by bringing scholars from different parts of Africa 
to, to guest lecture, to teach, to talk to students. And even this project as well is one of, uh, is, is, is a result of, of that um, important activity. Then the second um, analysis or the second part was um, you know, uh, um, a, a, a dialogue amongst between and amongst different disciplines, because um, we will know that they are in decolonizing the teaching of international law, we need to uh, borrow from other disciplines. We need to go to philosophy, anthropology, um, to go to political economy, cultural studies, and, and things like that. So it's very important that we also you know, reach out to, or we, we engage with colleagues from that discipline. And the third, which is very, very important, and which I, for me is also auto-critical, auto and auto-critique um, is um, a, a situation where you have uh, a genuine and sustained dialogue between teachers and um, learners, because um, we should also understand that um, our, our uh, students um, also have ideas and um, are also people who can shape the kind of thinking or they shape the, what, what they receive or what they wish to receive from us in as much as we need to guide them but we also need to listen to them because there's a whole lot we can learn um, from their activities. And, you know, they, we've, we've seen that through um, uh, the theme of four protests um, in, in, in South Africa. We've seen it through, uh, you know, the hot uh, approach, which um, Humphrey here is actually uh, uh, one of the patrons of students meeting every week uh, in, a, in a Strathmore University. And now some of those students have actually, um, uh, I mean, I've seen some of their writings and in terms of, you know, what they've learned from it, they, you know, transcended that, um, that, that, that um, thing, but that was foundational for them. So it's very important that we, we also take that into consideration. And of course, um, as I said in the book, I'm sorry, in the chapter, this is not a, Ex cathedra, right? This is not the, the final approach. It's it's the you know the start of a dialogue, um, and there will be many many more um, many more approaches. From you know we experiment with it. At times we fail. At times we succeed. And of course we share notes and um, keep doing projects like this. Um, maybe at some point the Center for Human Rights would um, also have a book project on where students actually you know speak about their experiences in terms of how they've you know received or how they've been taught uh, on international human rights law international law and, uh, and, and, and and those things so that we as lecturers and teachers can also learn from them thank you very much um thank you very much um professor Fabrico, for for those remarks um, so I think um, I'll just go back to Humphrey and um, you can just um, quickly talk to us um, about your about your chapter, Humphrey. Um, yeah, thanks, Felicia. I actually realized I, 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 I thought <laughs> it was actually mentioned about a bit of my chapter before, uh, yeah, but just a quick mention. And I should also mention actually, uh, by Prof. Azim. Thanks for the mention of the heart. The backstory of the heart was actually a conversation that uh, Professor Mbani and I had on one of the evenings during the 2017 roundtable. So we were in Pretoria and we, after the day's deliberation, we were just ruminating and asking ourselves, um, are we doing enough? Like uh, our students leaving the university through our hands with a critical understanding of their own continent. And, and so actually it's interesting that the heart find, finds its roots in, in a prior uh, event that leads towards this book as well. Um, we, so yeah, um, Professor Ambani being uh, one of those who created this, um, the one who created this really. Um, yeah, so yeah, my chapter was, um, was a biography as, as it were, a biographic of, of Kevin Bai. Um, the more I, I study the man, the more I'm fascinated by him. Um, there are many aspects about him that fascinate me. His curious duality, he had fascinating dualities. He both was very progressive and very traditional. 
he was both very open minded and very grounded in his islamic and wall of roots he um in fact the, the word that his biographer shek yerim sek uses to describe his refined french is actually a specific term in in french that that connotes a certain refined speech but uh, you must be really cultured in french thinking to to speak like that and yet even with all his french training and his french articulation and enunciation he was very much grounded in fact he's again his his biographer sec recounts that given by was offered by senegal a second term at the icj after the end of his first nine year term 8180 8190 and he refused because he didn't he was tired of living far from senegal and he wanted to leave, he wanted to live in the hague he wanted to live in senegal um i think his one of his greatest contributions was his insistence that ethical standards are legal obligations this is drawn from his time when he was president of the supreme court of senegal 8461 8, the number of times he had clashes with leopold seda senghor in fighting for the integrity of the judiciary as it was then um to his experiences post uh, and so when you study the man you, you get fascinated by his his personality and how in the end i think he was totally heartbroken by the senegal he came back to and the banality with which public affairs were conducted and the casualness with which corruption and and not corruption meaning economic corruption but and moral corruption not in the sense of being moralistic but that sense of duty to serve the public that just wasn't there something that unfortunately has become normalized something i, I think if, if sometimes when you when you look at the, the experiences that we have seen from african public officials in the last 30 40 years you think we need to teach more about kipumbaya's the ability to comprehend that public official would not have honor would not have integrity and he was speaking about integrity and leadership values being constitutional legal obligations for back then you know decades past before african countries began to change their constitutions in the 90s and 2000s and add these kinds of thinking um that was the biographic the second part of was to understand Pro, and suggest a methodology by which we could study african approaches to international law if we are going to propose that african approaches to international law is a methodical theological school of thought um uh, and uh, professor kafo uh, lays down this debate uh, by trying to understand these critical schools are they are they schools of thought are they methodologies and and so i thought we need a methodology do we have a methodology and my thought process was to say if there is a methodology you'll find it in the in the practice so look at look at what has been done and see if there is a method um, and, and and so my approach is to to again drawn from from uh, a quote by uh, um, james cameron and uh, james Uh, James Crawford and <laughs> the the late uh, ICJ judge James Crawford and, um, and Cameron Miles in an article where they talked about the histories of international law and they say that one of the ways international law can be studied is to look at the persons who interact with international law, who define international law whose practice makes international law and he speaks of diplomats international judges ministers of foreign affairs Uh, attorney generals people who craft the thought that becomes the legal standards that become international law and in the context of kebambai this is what my my chapter tries to 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 think through i try to 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 use some counsel from methodological texts from history to, which caution about how to study history so that when even when we are studying legal history we are true to historical method while we are at the same time being true to legal method which i think is what i propose would be the best way to approach it and so i try to make a contribution by saying if we are going to use the orb of great african thinkers 
of international law to study the history of international law or African approaches to international law, then we best keep track of those methodological uh, challenges and integrate them into our research. So, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope this will, my hope is that it spurs a conversation around methodologies um, because they are, they are important in, in the critical analysis of, of schools of thought and, and, and in asserting um, uh, a trend, uh, an existence of, of an African way of doing international law. Um, thank you for the show. Um, thank you very much, um, Enfo, for your presentation. Uh, I, I think on my list, um, I think to have covered all of the authors that I can see, but just um, because of human errors, I would just want to ask, please, if there's any author that is online that I have not called and would want to make a presentation, can you please um, just raise up your hand? Any. Okay, um, I think we can we can assume that we have sufficiently covered um, the authors that we have with us um, online. And I would then um, like to call on our next um, speaker, um, Professor Chris Mena Peter who is an emeritus uh, professor of law at the School of Law, University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and also a member of the um, United Nations International um, Law Commission to give us some brief remarks and insight um, about, about this book. Um, professor Mena actually wrote a preface to the book and I'm sure um, he has something um, to tell us in the next five minutes of the book. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Faluso. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the, the editors, uh, Franz, uh, Humphrey, and yourself for the book, because um, every publication is a reason for a celebration. So you allowed us to celebrate by coming out with this book. So we are very grateful for you, to, to, to you. Uh, secondly, I want to thank the authors, uh, the, the, the editors for, for agreeing to consider uh, and accept my proposal for the title of the book. Uh, I was, in my proposal, I was insisting that, uh, however, the formulation of the book, of the title is, the name of Judge Kebambai should be on the title. And I'm very grateful that you accepted to, to that proposal. Uh, thirdly, I want to thank the editors for agreeing to take to, to turn the notes which are used in Pretoria during the conference uh, to be the, to, uh, to, to improve it, to make a preface which came out as um, from objects to subjects, reflections on Africans' contribution to international law. That is, in what areas have Africans made a difference in international law? And uh, I looked at uh, four areas where Africans have made a difference in international law. The first area is uh, in, the law, in the law of the sea. Uh, by coining and coming up with the concept of exclusive economic zone, which is a zone between territorial sea and the high sea, uh, and with not, not really high seas and also not, uh, not uh, territorial sea. Uh, and the players in this area were uh, mainly Frank Njenga uh, of Kenya, who was mentioned before. Uh, and the uh, alumni of Dar es Salaam University, I must mention also. Uh, uh, Joseph Warioba, uh, who later became the, the Prime Minister of the United Republic of Tanzania, contributed a lot in this area. And the Toma, Thomas Menza, uh, Mensa of uh, Ghana, they, they did contribute enormously in the pushing for acceptance of the exclusive economic zone. The, the second area I looked at was, uh, on human rights. Uh, in, in case of human rights, 
uh, through the the charter of the Banjo Charter of 1981, we came up with the concept of people's uh, people's rights, collective rights, group rights, or solidarity rights. And uh, here I must congratulate the Center for Human Rights of the University of Pretoria because they have been good ambassadors to African Africa and the human rights. Actually, they have done what was supposed to be done by Banjo. Uh, they have made uh, African position on human rights to be known uh, known beyond our borders. So the center has done a lot. And the people who played a, a, a very vital role here were, of course, Kebambai himself, uh, Taslim Olawale Elias of Nigeria, and of course, uh, Leopold Sendasengo, uh, the former president of Senegal as well. Uh, the third area is security, diplomacy, and international leadership. And here I'm looking at the contribution of people like Boutros, Boutros Ghali uh, of Egypt, the sixth UN Secretary General, uh, Dr. Kofi Annan of, of Ghana, the seventh UN, uh, UN Secretary General, and of course, uh, Madiba, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he also played a lot of uh, a, a, a very vital role in post-apartheid South Africa, and therefore contributed enormously on international leadership. He has been he has become an icon when it comes to to leadership. The fourth area which I looked at is disputes resolution and justice in general. And uh, here I'm looking at the contribution of Africans at the ICJ. Uh, as we have been told, uh, Kebambai uh, was once uh, the president of ICJ, uh, Mohamed Bejawi of Algeria, Taslim Olaware Elias uh, of Nigeria, and recently, most recently, Abdukawi Ahmed Yusuf of Somalia is the latest person to be African to be the president of ICJ. And uh, I have also uh, I also looked at uh, contribution of people uh, of uh, Africans in the International Criminal Court. Recently, we had uh, Chile Eboe Osuji of Nigeria as president, and also the Registrar of ICE, uh, International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, Fatu Bon Ben Suda of the Gambia. Uh, so. Mr. Chair, I would like to say that uh, personally, in conclusion, I would say that uh, I met Kebambai uh, in a human rights training in Strasbourg, France, in early 1980s, just after the adoption of the uh, of the of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and uh, he was there to explain to us the new charter. Uh, what it means, what are the background and so on. But by then we were young people, very combative, pretending that we know all human rights. And uh, we dismissed him completely saying that, uh, what a charter is this? There is no court, there is only a commission and uh, everything in the commission ends with the heads of state and government. So we just dismissed him and told him, no, no, no. Uh, this is nothing. But he was extremely calm, very calm. And he explained to us that uh, as Africans, we have to start somewhere. We shall move on. And, uh, and uh, actually, he was, in my opinion, more foresighted than all of us. He knew what was behind what they were doing. And we have seen the development of the human rights regime in Africa just the way uh, he, had, he had anticipated back in early 1980s, just after the, the adoption of the, of, the, of, the, of the charter. Therefore, we are celebrating a book uh, on a very great African, uh, an African with the dreams, who deserve a book like that to be written or edited in his honor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Prof. Peter, for, for those remarks. And um, now we will move to the official launch of the book, um, in the uh, virtual. But now um, I, I would uh, just to say that for purposes of launching the book and also giving us some perspective on discussions um, beyond the book itself, um, is the chief justice emeritus of um, Kenya, Professor Willie Mutunga. Um, professor Willie Mutunga is a professor um, of public law at Kabarak University. He was the 14th Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya and um, the first president of the Supreme Court under the 2010 Constitution. Um, recently, Professor Mutunga had served as consultant with the Constitutional Review Commission of the Gambia. He has also served as Secretary General of the Commonwealth Special, uh, Special Envoy to the Maldives. And also, um, Professor Mutunga has played a pivotal role in the constitution making processes in Kenya from the 1970s and also particularly in the early 1990s. Um, Professor Mutunga, through his um, advocacy in writing and judgment, has um, advocated for progressive jurisprudence for Africa and the global South as part of significant contribution in the struggle for a new just, peaceful, gender just, non racist, non ethnic non-militaristic, ecologically still, prosperous, egalitarian, and equitable socialist world. Um, during his tenure as Chief Justice, uh, Professor Mutunga sought to make permanent and indestructible foundations for a transformed judiciary, and he also achieved impressive progress in bringing the justice system closer to the ordinary people. Professor Mutunga is well known for his fight against corruption in the judiciary and in Kenya as a whole. And as one of Kenya's organic intellectuals, uh, Professor Mutunga has written and he has co-authored books and scholarly articles on various areas of intellectual of his intellectual interest and pursuit. He has continued to work with various um, social movements led by the grassroots youth and the middle classes that are committed to Kenya's fundamental transformation and a new world. Um, Professor Mutunga, Chief Justice Emeritus, I would like to invite you to please um, officially launch the book for us and also provide us with some reflection on um, activities or events beyond the book itself. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I put on my uh, video so that uh, um, people don't think I'm a robot and I'm going to switch it off so that uh, it doesn't mess up with you know, my few remarks, okay? Um, okay, Paul. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I, work, I welcome this uh, edited co collection that brings together scholars mostly from Africa, but also other parts of the global South to deliberate on what constitutes Africa's unique contributions to international law. I also welcome very much the book's uh, contributors uh, ra that range from professors of law <coughs> through early career scholars and most importantly, recently law graduates. This transgenerational effort to interrogate the African uh, contributions to global culture is necessary. I've spoken many times uh, before of the importance of reverse mentorship, uh, that we teachers must be open to mentorship that we can receive from our students, just as we expect them to be open to our mentorship. And this point has been made by one of the contributors before. I just wanted to add that in this uh, kind of uh, scholarship also, uh, the notion of reverse learning, you know, is very, 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 very important. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, scholarship coming from uh, Global South, uh invariably you know uh doesn't receive you know the kind of attention uh, uh it requires in the global 
in the global north. But as we talk in the 21st century about, uh, you know, solidarities, uh, I'm sure this, you know, uh, you know, reverse uh, learning will also be important. Now, I, I have, you know, on many occasions called, uh, you know, uh, legal scholars, you know, to, to lead the charge, you know, to explore the nuggets of wisdom that lie in forgot, uh, forgotten African uh, scholarship uh, while working in the judiciary, uh, we set up, you know, the Judiciary Training Institute. That was uh, a bridge between us and the, the academy and uh, jurists all over the place. And uh, that, 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 that bridge, you know, uh, has become uh, uh, permanent. And I think that's, you know, that's, uh, the way to proceed. Uh, and in, in terms of uh, the development of uh, uh, jurisprudence uh, that you know, we've called progressive, et cetera, the, the scholars you know, uh, are very pivotal. And of course, here, we, we, uh, when we look at the constitutions, we're not, talk, we're not seeing constitutions as uh, legal centric. We want to see, we want to admit that uh, these documents are ideological and political, you know, uh, as well. Um, and I've also made calls in the past uh, in, in, in urging the legal academy and the judiciary, you know, to develop uh, that jurisprudence you know, under our 2010 constitution. And I'm very glad to see that this task is in precisely these categories is uh, being implemented in African scholarship of international law. I'm also very happy that it's being done in a transgenerational scholarly projects. That's it's this one. As such intellectual projects are the key to securing a radical transformative future we have desired uh, for Africa. And this book uh, actually reminds me of the radical legal education we received in Dar es Salaam in the 60s and uh, 70s. Uh, the Dar Law School sought out to deliberately inculcate a desire to serve and transform Africa. Our teachers, many of, many of whom were revolutionaries in their own right, exposed us to revolutionary thoughts and the liberation movements of the time. Uh, most of these movements uh, are based in, uh, in Tanzania. And these movements not only changed you know, domestic law, but created the conditions for the challenging of an imperialized uh, exploitative status quo protected by international law in which Africa was considered uh, a mere bystander. Now, the new constitution uh, reflect the need for Africa to be the shapers and developers and, um, and also the transformers of, of, of that you know, conservative international law. And in the spirit of the method adopted by the Da Law School in the 60s and early 70s, and of course, continued um, in Nairobi in the 80s and in Da in the 80s as well, and also Makerere. Uh, it is critical as we reconstruct a radical and transformative vision of law for Africa. We keep in mind the importance of the in interdisciplinary approaches, you know, to the study of law. Um, so I've, 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 I've uh, and towards that end, you know, I've, I've also wondered why African governments only rely on lawyers when negotiating complex international agreements, uh, such as uh, the one Kenya signed with China for the construction of the standard gauge railway. Um, I guess uh, our, our governments take literally the notion that uh, 
uh, that lawyers are learned and they have forgotten that we are very, very ignorant uh, of other disciplines and uh, have urged that like in the negotiate, uh, negotiating of the free trade agreement with the US, uh, which I'm actually opposed to, uh, if, if, if the government wants to act in uh, national interest, it should use experts of various disciplines, uh, uh, as well as a commitment to uh, Kenya's uh, interests. Um, the converse of this view is also that lawyers interested in transforming Africa cannot be content to work alone or be poorly versed in other critical disciplines, whether it's history, finance, economics, political philosophy, sociology, science, theology. Our laws uh, continue to integrate regional, continental, and international law in our country laws. And one critical effect of this I've experienced when I served at the Apex Court in Kenya is that the Apex Court starts to interrogate and problematize its apex nature when such external jurisprudence uh, mitigates the finality of the decisions of the apex course. Article 163, sub Article 7 of the Kenyan Constitution decrees that all courts other than the Supreme Court are bound by the decision of the Supreme Court. Now, critique of decisions of apex course from this external jurisprudence, and of course, by the courts below and the legal scholars, uh, uh, you know, faces, you know, forces the apex court judges uh, to reverse their own decisions and continue uh, developing progressive uh, jurisprudence. So the, the jurisprudence of the apex court is not, it's not, it's not the final one. Now, Kevin Baye is reputed to have been a quick learner, and he had impressive impact on many areas of law, constitutional law, family law, international investment law, human rights law, sports arbitration, and so on. Uh, his example you know, remains alive today, for us today, and it's very, very, uh, I'm very, very, very happy that uh, the editors heeded, um, you know, the advice of uh, uh, Professor uh, Chris Minor Peter. That the name of this this particular uh, uh, African is uh, immortalized in this in this uh, in this in this book. I congratulate the authors and the editors and. Professor Chris Minor Peter for writing the preface and the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria for this contribution of African scholarship and look forward to many more. And I've been asked to virtually uh, launch this book and now it's my pleasure to declare this book launched. And, to, and I add, uh, by invoking my residual judicial powers that it is so ordered. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much um, to Justice Emeritus. And um, I mean, who are we to, to say we are not bound by your orders? We are definitely bound by your orders and um, the book has been officially um, launched. Um, but just for symbolic um, purposes as well, um, I think some of us um, are fortunate to have a physical copy of the book. I, I don't know how many of us fall in that category. I see Humphrey um, is at least not excited. I have one here with me. I see Prof. Frank has one. Um, so we're just going to lift it up. I mean, these are the times that we're living, um, virtual events. Um, we do have a lot of copies here, unfortunately, but uh, as things stand, I think it's just myself and Prof. France. So um, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Chief Justice Emeritus. And um, now, just quickly, um, I would like to open the floor um, for a few of our participants who are even um, some of our presenters as well. 
on just reflection and insight um, about potential ed ed um, entry points for furthering African approaches to international law exploration based on emerging issues and also um, further research area on publication. Maybe we can, um, if someone is interested, I would suggest, for example, air pollution in the global south. Um, does, does, that, does that give room for African approaches to international law? Please just raise your hand um, so that I can see. And maybe just to also quickly remind us to please um, fill the pop questionnaire for purposes of um, the Pretoria University Law Press. It has been shared again uh, by Lisa to everyone on the group chat so that we can just um, quickly do that as we are coming to the end of the event. Um, I think um, no one wants to talk now. I guess um, we will probably have written responses to some of these burning issues. And also to save time, um, I think it's it's quite good. So um, I will then go back um, to how we started, in a sense, by calling on um, the director of the Center for Human Rights um, and one of the editors of the book, Professor Franz Fillion, to give us um, his brief concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone's participation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Professor Mutunga, for your for your precious remarks and all our authors for sharing their own perceptions and interpretations. I, I think that I'll just go back for uh, one second to the title of the book. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Chris Manapita, for getting us to the right title. I think it is an excellent title. It captures the whole process of where we went uh, through this uh, process of getting to the end of the of the road with the book the book talks about exploring so there's something about the continuity that is suggested that i think is important and you know we have talked with uh, humphrey and others certainly we would see a collaboration with all the co-authors and others moving forward and further exploring exploring obviously is, is something that is not yet completed it's a work in progress we would very much, and we tried a little bit to reach out to the uh, foundation, the Kebam Bai Foundation, to reach out also across linguistic barriers and, and you know colonial boundaries uh, to the francophone and other language communities. So that's a, an ambition of of the project as we as we think about it going forward. That um, Humphrey and myself had certainly reflected upon. So uh, you could certainly expect, uh, at least from our side, some further iteration of the project and uh, that would include perhaps uh, this um, linguistic aspect of um, uh, going um, further I, I also just thought that in terms of what you know many people reiterated and emphasized exploring also I think is is in a sense inviting the prospect of being transformed many people use the the concept of transformation I think and and even speaking for myself this this morning earlier we were in a session where uh, it was about access to information in elections and the guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights was discussed. And I think at that moment I realized, and I hope this is the ambition perhaps of our book exploring, that, that people's, like the scales in some sense, maybe that's overly dramatic, but the scales would be lifted from our eyes or the reader's eyes that will have an, another way of looking and seeing and interrogating. Because when I then thought about that, that soft law instrument, I realized there's so much more that we can say and look at because it is a uniquely African instrument. No one has really made that point. We should be proud, we should celebrate, we should think through the scholarship that is happening from a particularly you know, African perspective and um, think what it means more fully. But I think hopefully for our readers, that will be a moment of, of kind of a, a new insight that will come having having perused through the, through the book. I also just want to, uh, I think it was uh, Rashmi who also emphasized 
the kind of decolonial style that we try to adopt in the in the pulp uh, book and uh, perhaps that's another way of uh, looking at things differently i i just want to emphasize that if you look at the footnotes you know pulp and this book we would not use Latin. We, in other, in other words, we don't say ibet, we don't say et al, we say and others. Uh, it's a little bit petty, if you like, small, but it is also to say, let's try to communicate in ways that are accessible. You could say that English is still a colonial language, yes, but I think at least it's uh, many generations closer to us than the original Latin that, that lawyers are so fond of, of making reference back to. So these are small matters, and I think for me personally also how this whole project is meant that I see it kind of epistemologically, I see referencing in a different way. When I when I refer to someone in my footnotes, I realize footnoting, referencing is privileging. And if we look at someone else's scholarship and our own scholarship, who do we reference? For a very kind of trite observation, you know, is 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 the referencing also filtered through our view of a, of an African kind of. Uh, starting point. Not to be exclusionary, I look at uh, Rashmi also there, not to be insular and exclusionary, but to be focused and inclusive and uh, exploring the South South Link. So all of these thoughts just came to my mind. I thank uh, very much everyone involved in the project once again. I think Humphrey, maybe uh, also just uh, you showed your hand. I'm very happy for you to make a, a remark or two, if you like. Um, just to say from my side, in conclusion, uh, thank you to the co-editors, the authors once again. Thank you to um, uh, Professor Mutunga for his kind presence here and remarks. Thank you for uh, the pulp team. Lizette uh, Herman, who has been, uh, you know, single-handedly the person bringing this text together in difficult circumstances. We thank you very much, uh, Lizette, uh, for your hard work on this text. Liesel, who is part of the pulp team. The cover, I think you'll agree, it is a beautiful cover. I mean, it is available online. I, I celebrate Yolanda Boysen, who was our communications manager until recently, was responsible for this. Um, thank her also in her absence. And I thank our communications team here at the center, uh, Marty and some people and others who uh, helped us to put this event together. Thank you so much from my side. I, I know that, uh, Felucia, you call on uh, Professor Ambani to have just a final say, but perhaps uh, just in terms of the way forward, uh, I'd be happy for uh, us to also just hear briefly from Humphrey one or two thoughts about you know taking this project forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, uh, uh, Again, uh, Prof. Ambani said this at the beginning, and yes, uh, in many ways, we thank the center for, for blazing the trail, as uh, again, Prof. Maina Peter has mentioned. Um, uh, this, these ideas about building your own referencing style and, and, and asserting, um, even if it's just to assert that you have an epistemology, you have a way of thinking, and it's your own. I think this we are learning from the center. Um, and we're thankful for the center for braving itself with these kinds of new ideas and styles and teaching us that we can do this and, and, and this is really excellent. Um, yes, we, Prof and I have, have thought really that and we, uh, we, we have tried to reach out to the Kebambaya Foundation, we will continue to do so and um, we really want in the, in the next conversations to, to have them on board. Um, as well as have a stronger conversation about the Francophone traditions. Of, and, and loose font traditions, Arabophone traditions of, of states and scholarship in Africa and how they contribute to international law. Um, in, in, in the conversation, and, and this uh, Rashmi reminds us again, is this, with the Global South, maybe also have more conversations with, with, the, with Latin America and, and the, the, the Latin South, which um, still holds the longest tradition of international law in any case, longer than Europe by far. Um, their international law is old and, 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 and wise, and uh, there's all, they're always fascinating nuggets to learn from them. Um, uh, Prof Mutunga has mentioned about interdisciplinary approaches. In this book, there are two non-lawyers who contribute, um, myself and uh, James Nyao, who is a political scientist, international relations uh, scholar. And, 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 and it would be nice to have more conversations about approaches from other disciplines and, and how they build and nourish uh, a project into the future. So I think those are the, and to add my voice to, to Prof and to, to contribute. Um, just two quick examples, Prof, that came to my mind as you were speaking. One is, um, speaking of referencing and privileging Africans, uh, 
Professor Mutunga won't say this himself, but um, if, there is, is, if there is one African scholar who, who can write an entire book and, and, and reference Africans, uh, great works uh, through and through is Professor Mutunga. He does this time and time again in his scholarship. And, and um, uh, I, I think I, I've mentioned him once that I'd like to study how he does that. <laughs> um, but yes, it is, it is a conscious choice because the scholarship is there. Um, there is no dearth of, of African epistemological thinking in any area. Of, uh, Professor Karim Hirji, who's, who, who writes a lot about decolonial um, thinking, quite critical African Tanzanian thinker, is actually a biochemist. Uh, and, and so there's, there's, there's no dearth of, of, of scholarship if we just privilege um, um, our own thinking. Uh, Professor Rahman herself has written about the work of uh, Justice Rajpal. Uh, Binod and and uh, and his work in the Tokyo tribunals. Uh, we hardly hear of the Tokyo tribunals, and and their contribution of global South thinkers in the construction of this this work back then. So that idea of privileging who you study from, I think, is central. Um, one other text that came out. This was the the report of the UN and the Independent Expert on International Solidarity, the 2021 report on COVID-19 and international solidarity. The international expert is, is himself a great trail scholar, uh, Professor Kafo, um, um, was also quite global South focused. And in the report, you realize that some of the first, and probably till now still only, but some of the first international treaty bodies to, to pronounce directions on human rights standards during COVID was the Inter-American Commission and the African Commission. Uh, concerns about burial rights and, and things like that, cultural violations, uh, and many others. So I think, yes, just that idea that being proud that uh, Global South institutions are uh, continuously developing uh, norms that are not up anywhere else, um, I think are, are elements of possible conversations into the future. Thank you, Prof, for, for, for the moment. Yeah, follow show uh, as we close. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alfa, for um, those um, words and um, giving us some of the way forward as well. I would um, like to then call on um, Professor Ambani to give us um, his concluding remarks. Felicia, if you may allow me to use this gadget, um, because I'm a bit up and down, so I'm using a different gadget. Um, for me, yes, I think um, it's that's just... Fine, Oh, great. Uh, for me, I think it's just to return thanks for all the contributors that have spoken and our special guests that have graced this occasion. And uh, also to say that these are the forums we need um, in terms of awareness uh, or what I would call consciousness raising, um, which are usually critical tools in, for example, social engineering. You don't engineer society without um, some consciousness levels going higher. Um, the other thing is, I think, to continue what the center has done quite well, and we join in, I speak for Kabarak here, we join in that mandate, whereby we are creating a critical mass of uh, academics that are conscious and providing a forum for them. So that, in, in other words, we are creating an epistemic community of some sorts, um, which will be useful in providing new frameworks, uh, providing alternative viewpoints, and then can move our people forward in terms of, for example, thinking international norm setting or even specifically human rights norm setting as we know it. I think the future is bright looking at what has just gone on today. And this is something that I can append my signature upon going forward. Thank you very much, Center for Human Rights. Thank you very much, the organizers led by Professor Franz William Humphrey and for Lucia for this great job done today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, um, Professor Ambani. And I think um, that, um, in a sense, um, brings us to the end of this um, of this event. I would just um, want to join um, the um, the directors, the two directors of the, um, the director of the Center for Human Rights and Professor John Ambani, and um, the editors as well as the authors. Um, I would want to thank everyone who has um, joined us for this event on our state um, for now.
And I would also want to particularly thank um, Chief Justice America Sunni Mutinga for still staying with us till now and for officially launching this book for us. And also Professor um, Chris Mena Peter for his um, participation in this event. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Human Rights and um, the Kabarak um, School of Law, at, uh, once again, thank you for joining us for this event. And um, this is where we draw the curtains. And I am pretty sure as you may have gleaned from um, the concluding remarks of Prof. Dion, um, Humphrey, and Professor Ambani that we are still exploring further. And this is definitely a space that will continue beyond um, today. Thank you very much, everyone, and um, have a great day, a great evening, a great morning, whatever, uh, whatever part of the world you are. Bye, everyone. Uh, Felicia, before you release everyone, uh, good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much again for joining. Can I just ask that everyone would switch on their video so that we just take a final screenshot um, as this has become the new way of documenting everyone's presence? Um, I will just um, keep waiting for the screens to keep adding. Looking lovely, everyone. There we go. Thank you so much, everyone who's turning on their video. If you're not in a position to turn on your video, that's perfectly fine. Um, Martin, do you mind um, just giving us one minute? Um, Prof. France is just rejoining us. That is perfectly fine. Everyone is looking lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to keep everyone here for too long. Prof. France has joined again. Um, I will use him as a benchmark <laughs> to see who else is here. Okay, uh, great. I'll, I'll, I'll just hold the book. <laughs> Great idea, Felicia. Thank you. And okay, one, two, three, cheese. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.